going to meditate for an hour. So first get your body into position. Find a comfortable posture. Try to keep your back straight. Face straight forward. Close your eyes. Place your hands in your lap, your right hand on top of your left. That's the body in position. Next step, get the mind in position. Think thoughts of goodwill, like the chant we had just now, may all beings be happy. Remind yourself there's no good reason to wish ill on anybody. May all beings find true happiness. The world would be a much better place if everybody could learn to look inside for their happiness instead of looking outside. So once you've thought those thoughts, now start looking inside yourself. That's the best way to start. Focus on your breath. Know when it's coming in, know when it's going out. Try to breathe comfortably. Don't force the breath. You're not here trying to put yourself into a trance. You're simply here to follow the way the breath feels, all the way in, all the way out. You can focus on any part of the body where the sensations are clear. Now the breath is coming in, now the breath is going out. And explore to see what rhythm of breathing feels best. Try long breathing, short breathing, or longer and shorter, or more middling deeper or more shallow, heavier or lighter, faster or slower. There's lots of ways of ex experimenting with the breath. Not only makes it more comfortable, but it makes it more interesting to sit here. Here it is, this energy in your body that keeps you alive. It has a huge impact on the health of the body. And for most of it, it's an area that we've hardly even looked at, much less explored. So here's a chance to explore. Try to maximize your inner resources here. See what, see what sense of ease and well-being you can develop simply by the way you breathe. There are two main advantages to the sense of ease that comes this way. One, it's not taking anything away from anyone else. And two, it's a very clear-sighted ease. It comes from a skill. It doesn't come from simply indulging yourself in sensual pleasures. It keeps the mind bright, clear, able to see what's going on. This was the ease that the Buddha realized could form an important part of the path. You probably know something of the story of the Buddha's life. And it's centered around this question of how to find a happiness that on the one hand is clear-sighted and on the other hand causes no harm to anybody, yourself or anyone else. There are two passages in the canon where he talks about the things he reflected on before he went out into the forest. One in which he reflects on how he was intoxicated with his youth, with his health, and his life, looking down on people who were old or sick or dead. And then one day he came to a census. Someday he too would be old, sick, and then dead. And so the pride he felt around his youth, his health, and his life was not really becoming. And it was setting him up for a major fall. So that was one problem with all the sensual pleasures he was enjoying. It had him intoxicated. He was drunk. Couldn't see things clearly. He had to get away from those pleasures if he wanted to see anything clearly at all. There's another passage, though, where he talks about seeing the world like a dwindling puddle. The water is getting less and less and less in the puddle, and the fish are fighting over the water flopping all around. And of course, the longer they flop around, the 
more the puddle dwindles away. This is another vision of the happiness that most of us go for. Dwindling resources, more and more of us. And to get some pleasure, you've got to fight other people off. It's a zero-sum game, or less than a zero-sum game, because the resources are dwindling all the time. So we reflected on that kind of happiness from that perspective. One, not only was it intoxicating and blinding, but two, it was also causing a lot of harm. So he went off into the forest, and ultimately he ended up going to the other extreme, trying to deny himself every pleasure imaginable. He wouldn't let himself breathe. He hardly ate anything at all. He got so thin that he would faint every time he would urinate or defecate. Kept that up for six years. And when you're denying yourself pleasure of any kind at all, you know it keeps you going. It's pride. So that was the second amazing turnaround in his life. The first one, of course, was simply leaving the palace. Think about all the famous wealthy people nowadays, how many see through the, the sham of their fame and their wealth and their power and abandon it all and go off in the forest. It's pretty remarkable that anyone would do that at all, but that's what the young prince did. The second amazing turnaround in his life was when he realized that those six years of austerities were not getting him anywhere either. He was willing to abandon the pride that had kept him going. He thought back on a moment from his childhood. His father had been plowing. And the canon simply says the father was plowing. The, com the commentary insists that it was some royal plowing ceremony. But either way, the, the young prince was sitting under a tree. His mind settled down with a state of ease and concentration. Just simply focused on the breath coming in and going out with a sense of ease and rapture in the simple process of breathing. There's awareness filling the body. And the question came to him, could this be the way to awakening? And he intuited that it could. But then the next question came up, well, why am I afraid of that pleasure? Is there anything blameworthy about it? And the more he reflected on it, he realized it was not blameworthy in either way. One, it wasn't intoxicating. It didn't blind him to what he was doing. And two, it didn't take anything away from anyone else. It was a blameless pleasure. So he realized there was nothing to fear. All he needed to do was to start eating again, and he'd have the strength of body he needed to get the mind back into that state of concentration. And then he followed that concentration. And it provided the basis for the knowledge that led to awakening, the total release, to a happiness that wasn't dependent on any conditions at all, inside or out. So as we're sitting here, we're following his path, trying to avoid the two extremes of sensual indulgence and self-torture by seeing if we can develop a happiness that is totally harmless and clear-headed. Now it takes work. Developing a sense of ease and rapture around the breath isn't something that comes automatically. You've got to work at it. You've got to think about the breath. You've got to watch the breath. You've got to evaluate the breath. which means that we're working on a skill. You can listen to the Dharma and hear all the wonderful things that the Buddha has to say about goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity, concentration, discernment, release. It's good to hear about those things because it opens our minds to possibilities that we might miss otherwise. It expands the range of our imagination. But simply hearing about them is not enough. As with any skill, you read a recipe in a book, and it's not the same as actually fixing the food and getting to taste it. Or you read about how to swim, well, it's not the same as actually getting into the water. 
and learning about your body through the process of learning how to swim. It's one thing to hear about the fact that people can focus on the breath and develop a sense of ease and rapture. It's another to actually give it a try. And oftentimes what we first run into are our own defilements, our greed, our anger, delusion, our distraction, pain, all get in the way. These are obstacles or hindrances. And so we have to do our best to overcome them, not get discouraged when we see them. I don't know how many people give up on the meditation, say, I can't meditate, my mind is too distracted. It's like saying, I can't go to the hospital to have my disease treated because I'm too sick. If you're sick, and you have to do whatever is required to get to the hospital, get to the doctor, so you can treat your illness. The same way with a mind, this mind that's distracted by pleasures that are intoxicating or pleasures that are harmful. You've got to do something about it, because otherwise if it's left to stay in its old ways, it's like an illness that's simply allowed to run its course. It can do permanent damage. It can kill you. So if you see that your mind is distracted, that should give you all the more encouragement that you've got to learn how to figure out ways of getting it back on the object you've chosen to concentrate on. If you find simply focusing on the breath is not compelling enough or not forceful enough, give it a meditation word. Bhutto is a common one. Bhut with the in-breath, to with the out means awake. Or any word that helps keep you focused on the breath. If you have trouble focusing on the breath, you can start out with thoughts of goodwill. Turn to something that you find encouraging or inspiring. Goodwill for all beings. Think about that for a while. Then it gives rise to a sense of ease and well-being inside. Here you are sitting, not wishing ill for anybody. Think of all the people out there who are wishing for harm, hoping for harm, wanting to kill, wanting to maim, wanting to see somebody else get theirs. And you're not indulging that. You're lifting your mind up above that. That can give rise to a sense of refreshment within. You can think about the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, anything you find inspiring. Once the mind has that sense of well-being, then notice how you're breathing in the midst of that well-being, and then try to maintain that kind of breath, that kind of well-being. as a means of tuning into what kind of breathing really feels good, and then try to maintain it, keep it going. This is something you've got to work at every day, so it becomes a skill. As with any other skill, it requires practice. One, you have to want to do it. Two, you have to stick with it. And three, you have to be very observant. Really. Pay close attention to what you're doing. And finally, use your imagination, use your ingenuity. When things aren't going well, try to figure out ways that help it along. And this way you begin to master the Buddhist skill. And it changes the balance of power in your mind, because now you have access to a sense of ease, well-being, pleasure. It's better than the things that we normally pursue. It doesn't harm anybody, doesn't take anything away. You may have noticed that chant we had just now on reflecting on the requisites. It's meant to remind you that simply by being alive and having this body requires food, clothing, medicine, shelter, things that involve suffering for somebody. Even if you eat vegetarian food, the farmers the people who transport the food. It's not easy work keeping people fed. The same goes for our food, clothing, excuse me, goes for our clothing and shelter and our medicine. 
there's always some suffering, there's always a burdensomeness, simply in the fact that we've got this body, we've got to keep going. And then on top of that, if you look for pleasures that impose on other people, you're creating even more of a burden. Which is all the more reason to try to work on a sense of ease that doesn't have to require burdening anybody outside. And at the same time, it creates fewer and fewer burdens for yourself. You don't have to go out and buy the breath. You don't have to borrow anybody's breath. You've got the breath right here. And if you're wise, you take advantage of what you've got right here. Learn to develop the resources that are immediately at hand. You can develop the sense of ease and well-being that's harmless and clear-headed, that allows you to understand your mind better. to see what you're doing more clearly, so that you're less and less inclined to cause harm to anyone else or to yourself. So do your best to try to develop this skill. It's the most useful skill you can have as a human being. It'll see you through all kinds of difficulties, give you a sense of inner stability security. You have your own inner refuge, no matter what happens outside. 